Good morning. Okay. So let's get started. Um, today, our uh, um, today, our uh, goal is going to be to have a group discussion for all of us, uh, which my understanding is that's more uh, usual for tutorials. Um, and we will uh, see what we can uh, learn. So if you go on to e-learning, there is a week five tutorial questions uh, listed. And I uh, would like you to submit a written answer for question number one by Sunday. And I would like you to submit, and we're going to discuss question number two here in the tutorial. So let me put question two into the chat so that we're all sort of able to look at it. Okay, so we are going to be critically assessing the rule against perpetuities today. So before we can critically assess anything, we have to understand what it is. So there's our first question. What is the rule against perpetuities? What is the rule against perpetuities? Sir? Yes, go ahead. I can try. I'm just going to give a white tank I understand by it. Right. Um, is it, okay, so it's a rule, um, it's a common law rule that kind of prevent persons from um, um, excessive, like long ownership over um, land. So um, it kind of protects ownership of private property from persons for a long time beyond, I guess, I guess there's a certain age limit. So um, I think that's what I kind of understand by the rule against per perpetuities. Perpetuities. Okay. So I think, you know, I think that that uh, helps us to understand, right? I think there's there's some truth in what you're you're saying. Let me see if I can rephrase it yes, in a way that, that maybe makes it a little clearer. Um, the rule against perpetuities says that any conveyance which creates a future interest 
that vests outside the perpetuities period is void. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit at a time, right? First of all, what's a conveyance? What's a conveyance? Sir? Yes, go ahead. Is it the transfer of, um, let's say, a legal rights of property from one person to another? It is, that is, that is, Basically correct, right? Gabrielle, you're absolutely right that it is a mechanism for uh, showing ownership. Um, they're usually contained in deeds, right? Particularly in deed-oriented uh, registration systems, but um, the conveyance is the writing that contains the language of transfer, right? That states who is the grantor, who's the grantee, and what they are uh, transferring, right? So that's the conveyance, okay? Um, so, we, so when the rule talks about a conveyance, that's what it means. It talks about the language that transfers the land, okay? What is a future interest? And Chantelle, I, I, I wanna say, I really appreciate you jumping in and participating, but I do wanna make sure that other folks uh, speak up as well. So I'm, I'm gonna ask someone who isn't Chantelle to, to answer the question of what is a future interest? So the future interest is the, um, it's the right to property ownership that does not include the right to present uh, to present possession or enjoyment of the property? Yeah, it's, it's some ownership interest that is uh, contained in space, right? Because we know that there's a piece of property attached to it and the time is not yet, right? So it's some, some property interest that rests in a future time. What does it mean for a future interest to vest? What does it mean for a future interest to vest? Go ahead, Maisha. Is it when the, the interest passed to the other person? When the, interest, interest. when the interest what? I'm sorry. When the interest has um, passed or you, 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 you know it's supposed to have it in the future actually take or has possession of it. Yes, that's exactly right. Sorry, I was, I'm, couldn't quite understand you, so I was trying to, to get my ears closer to the speaker. But yes, that's absolutely right. When a future interest vests, it becomes possessory. It becomes a present interest. And so that's exactly what we mean, okay? So what the rule is telling us is that if we attempt to create a future interest and it will not become possessory within the perpetuities period, we have failed to create a, few, a valid future interest, okay? So, now we get to the hard part. What is the perpetuities period?
Go ahead. That's the um, life of the owner plus 21 years. Is, is, that, is that it? Very close. Very close. The life of the owner is certainly part of it, but it's lives in being is the way the rule is, the common law rule is phrased uh, from the Duke of Norfolk's case. Okay. So 21 years from the end of lives in being. This raises, I think, you know, this sort of just kicks the can a little further down the road. What are lives in being? And Darren is right that the owner is, is a life in being, but they're not the only one. So who else is a life in being? Who else is a life in being? The heirs or descendants to the property. Um, well, Michaela, let me let me ask you this. Uh, if the uh, a state passes to the heirs upon the death of the grantee. Um, Maisha, we're going to come back to you. If the so, Michaela, if the estate passes to the heirs uh, upon the death of the grantee, and um, the perpetuities period doesn't begin to run until the heirs die, when does the perpetuities period begin to run? You're welcome to come off mute if you if you have the technical capacity to use voice. Um, hi, morning. Go ahead. Yes. Um, hi. Well, I'm not sure what you're asking. You're asking me whether when the perpetuity perpetuity period would start. Right, um, because, because if the heirs are lives in being, right, they take when the grantee dies. Right. But what if they weren't born when the conveyance was made? Are they still a life in being? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Maisha, you say that, it, that it's anyone that has an interest, whether present or future. Okay. Um, again, same question. What if the, what if a future interest is held by someone who isn't born yet? Are they a life in being? at the time of the conveyance? Um, I think it, it, at this point, is a difficult question for me to answer, but I would say that they are alive in being. Even if they weren't born at the time of the conveyance? Um, I would say yes. Why? Because um, I'm going to stop you right there because no judge anywhere in the common law would agree with that. Okay. I'm, I'm, you know, there's, 
a life in being has to exist. So if you aren't born at the time of the conveyance, how can you possibly, like you don't, you don't exist. Go ahead. Yeah, why, why I was saying that? Because I was thinking when someone says that they pass it to their ears and the ears are not, if the ears are not um, born of it, would it refer to them? So this is an understandable mistake. You are not the only person in this class to have thought that heirs uh, were lives in being. And I will say to you and to all of you, I will say the same thing that I said to everyone else who has asked that question, which is that um, no one has heirs until they die. And this is, this is an odd, this is a wrinkle of inheritance law that only matters for determining, for our purposes, only matters for determining who is a life in being for the rule against perpetuities. So when any conveyance that refers to heirs, those are not people, okay? At least not until the person who is, whose heirs they are actually dies, okay? They're just, it's this class of, of things out there that will exist, but don't exist right now, okay? And so your reasoning is sound, but it proceeds from a faulty assumption, okay? And so that's, that's why I, I sort of said, nope, this, doesn't, this won't fly, okay? Um, okay, so if we know now that lives in being have to be people that exist at the time of the conveyance, does that give us a better hook into who constitutes a life in being? How, so we know, we know that people who haven't been born are not lives in being. Presumably dead people are not lives in being because, you know, they're dead, uh, but who else? Who among the people that are alive at the time of the conveyance constitutes a life in being? I will give you this hint. It is almost certainly broader than your thinking. So whatever you're thinking, think bigger. So could like the bank be a life and being if there's no like determinable like heirs to like a property, I guess? Um, You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, the, the short answer is that um, I'm not convinced that any sort of corporate entity would be a life in being um, because uh, you know, corporate entities and, and business organizations are perpetual. They don't, uh, they don't die. Um, Bonnie, you say government. Do you mean like the state or do you mean like the prime minister and the cabinet? So for the same reason that I'm, I'm disinclined to say that corporate forms would be lives in being, I think that I'm inclined to agree uh, that to say the same as to the state, um, because I don't think, because the state doesn't die. You know what I mean? Um, at least we hope not. Um, so yeah. 
Boy, that's a really interesting question. What do you do with the corporate form? I know it's been answered. I just don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, okay. So we know that entities that don't die probably aren't lives in being. But who else? A tenant of an estate. So um, the first thing that I, I'm going to say about that suggestion, Michaela, is I want us to be careful and precise about um, the terminology that we use because a tenant is someone who has a particular form of interest in land, right? They have a leasehold, whereas um, the uh, the holder of a of an estate in fee or a life estate is the holder, right, or uh, the owner. Okay, so I I want it's very we want to be very careful that we aren't talking about tenants when we mean owners. And and that's not a criticism. That's just let's be careful about that in the you know sort of making sure that we we're, we're talking about the right group of people. Um, and certainly, right, the owner is a life and being, but is he the only life and being, or are they the only life and being? I'm not sure if this is a, a big problem in Barbados. I know like in Trinidad, we have a bit of an issue sometimes of like um, squatters rights. I don't know if it's like the technical legal term, but like um, of squatters taking over property. Um, I'm, I guess I'm not sure what you're asking, Darren. Oh, I wasn't sure if like a squatter could be like a life and being in certain cases. Oh, I mean, under certain cases, under certain rules, absolutely. Uh, Bonnie suggests that the owner's spouse could be a life and being. Again, under certain cases, under certain rules, absolutely, right? I'm going to give you guys a hint. In addition to the hint I gave you earlier of you should be thinking bigger, okay? I'm also going to tell you that the uh, definition of lives in being is not a list, it's a category. Riandra says, lives that are in existence and ascertainable at the creation of the interest. That is correct, right? And under the original common law, 
it was all lives, everybody who was alive at the time of the conveyance. Okay. Can anybody guess sort of why the judges might start to move away from that rule? Good morning. Morning. Um, maybe because, well, the lives and being these people the period, the time period is pretty long and nobody really lives for over a hundred years, so then people will be like dead. I think that's starting, I think that's, that's moving in the right direction, right? So lives in being include, uh, under the original formulation, lives in being include the people that are born on the day of the conveyance. So how long do we have to go until we know that every baby born on the day of the conveyance has died? And hopefully not died in infancy, right? Had a long and fruitful and happy life and died peacefully in their bed surrounded by their friends and loved ones. Um, how long do we have to wait? If you're confused about this and you're going, I don't know, that's more or less the position the judges found themselves in. So they started asking, well, how can we find a better rule that is a little easier for us to apply? And so one of the things that they did was they said, okay, we're only going to define lives in being as, as being a particular group of people that are identified in the conveyance. So you see conveyances sometimes that refer to what uh, is sometimes called a royal lives clause. And so it's, um, it says that future interests must vest within the lifetimes of the living descendants of the Queen of England, okay? In the United States, you'll see people use the Kennedys as, as lives and being. And the idea is that this is a group of people who are public facing, whose deaths will be newsworthy and noteworthy, and who we know who is in the set. So we know who, we know, uh, who in the royal family is alive at the time of the conveyance. We know who among the Kennedys are alive at the time of the conveyance, right? And once all of those people are dead, then the 21 years starts to run, okay? So this is, this is one way. The other way that the judges have sort of created a definable life and being list is to say, okay, lives and being refers to individuals who are, uh, who exist and are named in the conveyance, okay? So let me put a conveyance into the chat. Okay, 2A, until B's grandchild reaches the age of majority and then to C and their heirs. Who are the lives in being in this conveyance? Again, these are ascertainable individuals that exist at the time of the conveyance. Um, hi, morning. I think A would be, yeah, A. Is okay. that the only one or? Because I was, 
thinking Anybody, C. You were thinking C? Okay. Yeah. Any, is there anyone else? Okay, remember what we said earlier about heirs don't exist until someone dies. So, so we know that heirs aren't lives in being. Um, and, and I think that, you know, you guys are right that A is a life in being, right? A is an ascertainable individual that is mentioned in the conveyance, right? Is C an ascertainable individual that is named in the conveyance? This question is a lot easier. Yes, yes, it is. Thank you, Nikila. Okay. Um, what about B? What about B or B's grandchild? So, Gabrielle, you think that B's grandchild is a life in being. Can you explain why? because the name was in the conveyance, okay? How do we change, how do I change your answer if I tell you that B at the time of, convey, of the conveyance has no grandchildren? So Gabrielle has taken the position that B's grandchild is a life in being because it's an ascertainable individual that is named in the conveyance. I think that's a correct, I think that's correct with no further facts, right? There's no further facts, that's a correct answer. I have now given the additional fact that B has no grandchildren at the time of the conveyance. How does that change your analysis? There is no grant, that's correct, right? Is B a life in being? Nikila says yes. Why? Conveyance states that it will be given to A until B's. Sure, right? And I think that, um, again, absent further facts, right? If all I've, exactly, yes, assuming B is alive. Absent further facts, if I tell you that B doesn't have a grandchild at the time of the conveyance, then you are, you are correct that 
if I haven't told you that B is dead, that B is therefore a life in being, right? So, so yes, this is correct, okay? Um, there may be authorities out there that will tell you that both B and the grandchild are lives in being so long as they are alive and exist at the time of the conveyance, okay? I think that's a reasonable conclusion. Um, and so you should check your, your local authorities at any given point. Um, okay. So this is what we mean by lives and go ahead, Maisha. Yeah. A question. So in the scenario that you just gave, if B has no grandchild, then the then it will be conveyed to no one because it was to be it was to A plant B plant to reach the age of majority and then to C. But if there's no grandchild in existence, then who is it conveyed to? Okay. So this raises this actually raises the next question that I wanted to ask you guys. So let me put the conveyance back into the um, back into the chat so that we all have it in front of us. Okay, so this is the conveyance. Now, let us assume that B has died and they have a child, but no grandchildren yet. Um, and A has died and uh, C has died. Okay, so just to be clear, and I will put this into the chat. So A, B, and C have died. B has a uh, child, but no grandchildren. Okay, so at this time, A's heirs hold the land. Okay. C's heirs file suit to quiet title and declare that their whether their interest is valid or not. Who wins? So, Michaela, the question, and I'm going to put it in the chat, C's heirs file suit to quiet title uh, declaring their future interest valid. A's heirs argue that C's interest violates the rule against perpetuities. Who wins? So there's no, 
you know, there is no question, Gabrielle, that A's heirs have the present possessory interest. The question that we are being tasked with is whether C's future interest is valid given the fact that, uh, that A, B, and C have all died and B has the possibility of grandchildren, but none yet. Who wins? Bonnie says C wins. Bonnie, why do you think C wins? I think that C wins because um, this law has to do with those who are present, not the possibility so much, but who actually is there. I'm you're you're breaking up, Bonnie. Yeah. Sorry. Say say it again. To consider B would be considering B along with other possibilities, but the essence of this um, property law is to deal with who is existing. So C would be the ones who would be existing rather than is future is that is not existing. I think I think you may be having technical problems because I, I'm not sure I understood any of that. Um, so let me let me tell you what's going on, okay? Under the original common law formulation of the rule, A wins, A's heirs win. Here's why. The determination of when a of whether a future interest is valid under the original rule was done at the time of the conveyance so if at the time of the conveyance b has no grandchildren then it's impossible for that interest to vest within the limitations period Okay. And if we don't know, if we don't know if the interest will vest, if it, if there's a possibility that it doesn't vest, then the, the interest is void. Okay. So this is the original common law formulation. What has happened is that a lot of jurisdictions have adopted what is called the wait and see approach. Yeah, A died, but their heirs still hold the land, right? Because A has a fee simple defeasible. And so the, the, the heirs hold the land, you know, A and their heirs continue to hold the land until the, uh, until the, the condition is met um, and the future interest vests, okay? We talked about this on Tuesday that, you know, the, the words of conveyance that 2A conveys fee simple unless you're in a jurisdiction where it conveys a life estate. Um, okay. Uh, so, so that's the common law rule. Under the wait and see approach, the court says, okay, we are willing to uh, let, let time march on 
and if the perpetuities period runs and the interest has not vested, well, then that means that the uh, that it cannot vest and it is therefore void, right? If the uh, if the if the future interest vests at some point during the perpetuities period, then that must mean that it was valid. Okay, so that's the wait and see approach. And finally, and the last thing that we'll talk about and then we'll sort of let this let this go for the morning the last thing that we'll talk about is the perpetuity the length of the perpetuities period right how long does do we wait before we declare that the interest is void okay under the common law it was 21 years but that's been changed by statute in a lot of places, okay? In the, in Barbados, uh, it's been adopted as 80 years. Um, a lot of Caribbean jurisdictions have adopted 80 year perpetuities periods. Um, the uh, uniform statutory rule against perpetuities that has been adopted in some American states uses a 90 year perpetuities period. And by the way, if in all of these cases, if there's a statute that prescribes a perpetuities period, it is always going to be from the date of the conveyance. So it's 80 years from the date of the conveyance. It's 90 years from the date of the conveyance, okay? The statutes do away with lives and being but not every jurisdiction has adopted a statute. And so the common law rule still applies in some jurisdictions. Um, so the Cayman Islands has adopted 150 years as the perpetuities period. Florida has adopted 360 years, which is insane, but that's what they did. Um, and then we have the two extremes. Some jurisdictions, including in the Caribbean, the Bahamas, have abolished the rule against perpetuities. And I can stack future interests up forever, and they will be good for 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 years, okay? And I can define the disposition of the property forever. On the other hand, in Guyana, you may remember at the beginning of the semester, we talked about how in Guyana, land is owned absolutely by present owners. There's no such thing as a future interest. You own all the land, you own it forever. When you sell it, you sell it, you sell all of it forever, okay? So these are the extremes. And then the rule against perpetuities is this, balancing act, right, between the Guyanese control of present holders and the Bahamian control of past owners, okay? So this is the rule against perpetuities. Um, I really appreciate your hard work today in piecing this together. This is a really complicated and difficult concept for law students to wrap their heads around. But it's important because it plays a role in a lot of the things that we do, okay? So this is why we took the time to sort of grapple with this. If you find this interesting or if you find it confusing, I really want to encourage you to take Dr. Yearwood's classes on trusts and then we can, uh, and then you'll, you'll learn a lot more about it, okay? So with that, I'm going to let you guys go. I will see you this afternoon, and take care. Bye.